Hello, this is Pastor Patrick Hines here at Birdwell Heights Presbyterian Church, and today I'd like to start um, another series I'll probably never finish. Um, <laughs> I want to uh, address the issue of covenant theology. I think it's a very important topic. Um, I've noticed uh, in a lot of the questions that I get and a lot of the emails I get uh, from folks um, are about how much they've been helped by sermons I've done on covenant theology, sermons I've done on infant baptism, uh, sermons I've done on the gospel um, across both testaments. And it's starting to kind of bear down on me. This is a topic that's not really uh, covered a whole lot in churches, it seems today. So I want to do a video series um, and follow some of the sermon manuscripts that I, I uh, used in the Exodus series I've been doing. Uh, and also just give some more uh, thoughts and more insights uh, into this extremely important subject uh, of covenant theology. <clears throat> The fact of the matter is, really, at the end of the day, um, there's no way of making sense of Scripture in general without uh, arranging it and organizing it uh, in terms of covenants, because that's clearly what you have going on here. Um, you have the covenant of works, covenant of grace. That's how we uh, divide um, the Word of God up. And it's not Old Testament, New Testament, by any stretch of the imagination. The covenant of works, covenant of grace, you see going side by side throughout the Bible. And <clears throat> one of the... <clears throat> main points that I want to emphasize um, is the unity of the one covenant of grace. I think this is a subject that um, scripture really, it, it could not possibly be any clearer than it is in scripture. I don't know how you can read the Bible and not see this. Um, especially um, as I started to develop my own theology, understanding um, the Bible better, going through some of the standard um, systematic theologies that are available out there, uh, and not only just the Reformed systematicians, but also just seeing what some of the patristic sources like Irenaeus, Augustine, and others, what people have seen in Scripture. You have clearly a covenant of obedience, a covenant requiring obedience, um, what we call the covenant of works. Sometimes it's called the covenant of life, uh, emphasizing what the reward would have been for obedience uh, with Adam and all of Adam's posterity in him. That's the first covenant. That's the covenant of works. And uh, I wanted to walk through the, um, the Westminster Confession on just these two great covenants that you see in Scripture. Now, people often will, will say, I don't really get, you know, why, why do you talk about there being one covenant of grace when there's clearly a whole bunch of covenants? Um, after the fall of, of man into sin, you have a bunch of different covenants that take place. You have the Abrahamic covenant, the Noahic covenant, um, the Davidic covenant, the New Covenant. You have all this, all these other successive covenants. Why, why do you say there's only one covenant of grace? Well, that's part of what I want to talk about um, in this brief series. And just to make a long story short, just to tell you, to show you right up front what I mean, the reason that we speak of there being one and only one covenant of grace is because there has been one and only one way of salvation from the fall of man into sin. No one has ever been saved by anything other than the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ, either anticipated um, in the Old Testament uh, or uh, having already come in the New Testament. Okay, so there, there are not different covenants of grace. There's one covenant of grace that's administered differently throughout time uh, as God revealed more and more and more information about it. But what's made clear right at the outset, though, as soon as man falls into sin, Genesis 3, verse 15, and in fact, I'd like to uh, pull this up here so you can see it. Um, if I remember how to do this, right? There's a uh, Bible works. Here I'm looking at the Westminster Confession, but we'll go back to that here in just a second. But Genesis 3:15. If I put a Bible on there first, Genesis 3:15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise or crush your head, and you shall crush or bruise his heel. Now, what's clear from that passage right there, that revelation right there? A seed of the woman, a, a future descendant, a physical descendant of the woman, is going to destroy the works of the devil and bring salvation to God's people. And the only reason that, that Adam and Eve did not fall dead there at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when they sinned is because God intended to have a church. He intended to have a group of people that he was going to save from this ruin uh, and bring into an estate of salvation by this seed of the woman, by this redeemer. Okay, so there you have the uh, the promise that God makes. That's really the first um, announcement of grace, the first announcement of the gospel uh, made in Scripture. In fact, theologians call Genesis three fifteen the proto evangelion, um, the the first gospel pronouncement. Now, just to, real quick here, go back to the Westminster, whoops, the Westminster Confession, uh, and go to chapter seven. Chapter seven is an extremely important chapter. 
And uh, point number two here in the Westminster Confession of chapter seven, the point number one is simply talking about how um, the distance between God and us is so great that um, we could not know him unless he expressed himself by way of covenant. God voluntarily uh, condescends to us um, and enters into covenant with us. Okay. Now, what's very important here to emphasize as well, um, and there's been great confusion about this lately, and there's, no, there's really no need for this confusion, but for some reason, I don't know why Reformed theologians have been talking this way, because they're wrong when they do. Um, the covenant that was made with man, with Adam and his posterity in the Garden of Eden, the, grace is not part of this at all. This is not a gracious covenant. It is a works covenant, period. The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works, wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. Okay, that's the, the covenant of works, the covenant of life. God enters into this with Adam and all his posterity in him upon condition of perfect and personal obedience now that covenant is still in effect right now that's why we all need christ because that covenant has got to be kept by someone it's got to be fulfilled by someone that's why we need a savior that's why we need jesus that's why the concept of sin is such a big deal um if i have violated any of god's commandments even one time then justification by works has ceased to be possible for me uh, because the covenant of works does not allow for uh, it, 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 upon a condition of perfect and personal obedience. See, they're perfect and personal obedience. Uh, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything in the book of the law. Galatians 3.10, they're citing from Deuteronomy uh, 27, 26, I believe it is. So it's very important to understand that the first covenant is a works covenant. It is not, Adam did not live by grace through faith because there's no need for grace yet. There's no need for grace when a man is in an unfallen condition. Okay, and the uh, uh, point number one here says that God enters into covenant by some voluntary condescension, not by grace, because there's no need for grace before sin, but he voluntarily enters into covenant with man. Okay, now the first covenant was broken, you know, so let's look at point number three. Man by his fall, having made himself incapable of life by that covenant, the Lord was pleased to make a second covenant commonly called the covenant of grace, whereby he freely offereth unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit to make them willing and able to believe. Now, point number four is very important as well. We're going to go through all the scripture passages here and many more that aren't even cited here. This covenant of grace is frequently set forth in scripture by the name of a testament in reference to the death of Jesus Christ, the testator, and to the everlasting inheritance with all things belonging to it therein bequeathed. Okay? This covenant, the one covenant of grace, was differently administered in the time of the law and in the time of the gospel. Okay? So you see what, what it's saying? It's the same covenant of grace. It's the same gospel. But it was d administered differently in the time of the law, meaning the Mosaic covenant, and in the time of the gospel. Okay? Under the law, it was administered by promises, by the Abrahamic promises, prophecies about the coming of Christ, sacrifices like the sacrificial system, the Passover lamb, pardon me, circumcision, the Paschal lamb, and other types and ordinances delivered to the people of the Jews, all for signifying Christ to come, which were for that time sufficient and efficacious through the operation of the Spirit to instruct and build up the elect in faith in the promised Messiah. See what that's saying? So the gospel is revealed in the Old Testament. It's revealed there in the Old Testament, but through the promises that God made to Abraham and through the prophecies of the coming of Christ, the sacrificial system, everything else, it was revealed there, okay, and which were for that time sufficient and efficacious to build up the elect and the promised Messiah, by whom they had full remission of sins and eternal salvation, and is called the Old Testament. So there is not a time in human history when people were saved by keeping the Ten Commandments. And the reason that there wasn't is because it, there never could be. Um, we are not capable of keeping the law. We can't do it, and therefore salvation by it is impossible. That's why we have to rely completely and only uh, that someone else has done it for us. The moment Adam sinned, my subjective transformation, my works, cannot enter into the salvation equation anywhere. They cannot be what saves me at the last day, or what gets me into heaven, or what justifies me before God. Okay, under the gospel, when Christ the substance was exhibited, the ordinances in which this covenant is dispensed are the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which 
Though fewer in number, and administered with more simplicity and less outward glory, yet in them it is held forth in more fullness, evidence, and spiritual efficacy to all nations, both Jews and Gentiles, and is called the New Testament. There are not, therefore, two covenants of grace differing in substance, but one and the same covenant under various dispensations. Okay, so the, the Old Testament scripture uh, and the promises God made Abraham, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the New Covenant, they are all part of the covenant of grace. Okay, and <clears throat> the way in which sinners were justified before God never changes in any of those covenants. What you have is simply the unfolding of the revelation, the unfolding revelation of more and more information about the gospel, but it's not a different gospel. Uh, one of the most common errors that people make is, well, o Old Covenant, o Old Testament law, New Testament gospel, that's not it at all. That's not the case at all. Uh, and that's what Paul's whole argument is in Romans chapter 4. In fact, let's, um, before I get into more material here, Romans 4 is such a, a pivotal key uh, passage here uh, in this regard. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So there you have Abraham, before the law was even given, is justified by faith apart from works. He believes, and it's accounted to him for righteousness. Verse 4. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. God justifies the wicked, the ungodly, while they're still ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Now notice David is now brought up. Now David lives after the Mosaic Covenant. What do we learn from this passage? This is one of the reasons I believe what I do about this. This is one of the main passages that convinced me that covenant theology was true. It's also one of the main reasons I believe in infant baptism as well. David was justified in exactly the same way that Abraham was. So even after the Sinaitic covenant, it's the same, same gospel. Same gospel. Now, moving down to the end of the chapter, speaking of, of David, Abraham, and so on and so forth, and talking about Abraham and Sarah and everything else, and he says, in verse 23, Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us, meaning New Testament believers. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Okay, so Abraham was justified by faith alone in the coming of Christ. David, after the Sinaitic covenant, is justified by faith alone in the coming of Christ. We, who have believed the preaching of the gospel, we are justified by faith alone apart from works after the coming of Christ. You see why, you, the reason I believe in covenant theology is Paul did. Paul clearly is teaching that here. Okay, it's not a different gospel. It's not a new, um, the new covenant is not entirely new in, in the sense that its essence is unheard of. In fact, the new covenant really is identical uh, to the Abrahamic covenant uh, before it. Because it's the same mediator, the same requirements, repentance and faith, the same benefits, regeneration, justification, sanctification, and eternal life. Okay, so that's really what's at the heart of covenant theology. And so we look at how the covenant was administered before the coming of Jesus, and it included households and the giving of the signs. Circumcision um, is a sign of the gospel. It's a sign of justification before God by faith, and yet it was given to those incapable of making a profession of faith. And what you see in the New Testament is households being baptized. You don't see any indication that that's now changed or different. So that's one of the reasons that we believe what we do about it. Okay, now... We talk a lot in our circles about dispensationalism, and we, we do so in a, in a derogatory sense. We, we speak of dispensationalism as being a, a bad system of doctrine. It's not biblical. It's not accurate. And old school dispensationalism certainly has a lot of huge problems. Um, dispensationalism today, though, is not your, it's not your father's dispensationalism. <laughs> like they say, it's not your grandfather's Oldsmobile. Um, it's not really what was taught by Schofield and Darby in the mid-19th and 20th centuries. But old-school dispensationalism taught that there are seven distinct economies or dispensations wherein God interacts differently with mankind for his salvation. Now, that's the great error in dispensationalism. The idea that God could save people in one way, by works, or by, the ten, by keeping the law in one dispensation, and then by grace and not by works in another dispensation is totally unbiblical. Romans 4 just explodes the whole idea, so does Galatians 3. Really, the whole New Testament does. The other great error of dispensationalism is their teaching that God has one distinct plan of salvation for the Jews and another different plan of salvation for another people called, quote, the church, end quote. 
This is where the idea of the so-called rapture followed by seven years of tribulation comes from. The basic teaching goes something like this. The first time Jesus came, he came with an offer of the kingdom to the Jewish people. They rejected that offer. So as plan B, Jesus decides to go to the cross and do the church age for a couple thousand years at least. At the end of the so-called church age, the church will be raptured secretly off the earth and then God will go back to dealing with national Israel again. Now, there are various nuances to the different takes on this, but I want to share with you all uh, <clears throat> that long ago, a dispensational friend of mine gave me four audio cassettes called Living in the Light of Christ's Return, in which all this was spelled out in great detail. And I listened to those cassettes over and over and over again in my car. I, when I, I first graduated from college, um, my first job was about a 40-minute drive to and from work every day. And so I listened to those tapes, just just listen, just wore the ferrous oxide off of those tapes in my car. And again and again, I was just left scratching my head thinking, how in the world was I supposed to have thought that that's what those passages actually mean? Uh, just a, a couple of examples. Um, I was able eventually to sit down with a tape player at a desk and actually write down references and look things up in my Bible and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and, you know, it took my breath away. Uh, when the argument was made that the book of Revelation, uh, in the book of Revelation, the sign of the beast, the number 666, with a microchip of some, some kind, would be installed in human wrists, uh, I really started to sit back in my chair wondering how anyone reading the book of Revelation, when it was first written, would ever have known that. How would they ever, I mean, th that would make the book essentially unintelligible to, for the people that it was written to in the first century. When they got it, they, I mean, how could they ever have known anything about microchips? Okay? Uh, the teacher in this tape series also said that because human wrists are easy to cut off and steal, the microchip would start being installed in human foreheads instead because a head is, is harder to remove than a hand, and a head is harder to hide than a hand. <laughs> And uh, I'll tell you, after listening to that, and not being aware of any other schools of eschatology out there, I eventually just shelved the whole subject of eschatology and said, I, obviously, I'm just not intelligent enough to understand the stuff in the Bible. I'm just going to stick to things that are a little less abstract. But eventually, thank God, I was introduced to John Calvin and Louis Burkhoff and Charles and A.A. A. Hodge and Robert Dabney and B.B. Warfield and Michael Horton and Robert Raymond and others. I started looking up all the passages that they cited in their books on in, the, in their sections on covenants, and the Bible teaches that there is one and only one covenant of grace. <clears throat> there is unity <clears throat> in the covenant of grace. There is essential continuity, not discontinuity. We have to believe this because everyone who has ever been justified before God and gone to heaven when they died did so in exactly, precisely the same manner, by faith alone in the redemptive revelation that was available to them at the time. It was always justification by faith alone in Christ alone. There are not different plans of salvation for different people at different times. And there are also not different peoples of God, Israel, and then, then this new thing called the church. Uh, I had a man from another perspective. Um, in fact, it was, it was Brandon Adams, uh, who claims to be reformed uh, and not a dispensationalist. He told me uh, his exact words. There is no organized church on earth until Acts chapter 2. I just have to say, that is a perfectly false statement. There is a very very organized church, beginning with Adam, through Seth, down to Noah, and then to Abram, uh, with the people of Israel, and then in all those synagogues throughout the world where believers worship together under the oversight of elders, etc. All the way up to the time of Christ. There's one church, one people of God. One God, one gospel, one covenant of grace. The church is not a distinctly New Testament concept. That's why the Hebrew terms Eda and Kahal are translated into the Septuagint as Sunagego, Sunagagas, synagogue, and also ecclesia, church. So when Jesus spoke about building his church in Matthew 16, and when he mentions the church in Matthew 18, that was not a new concept. That was not a new concept. They knew exactly what he was talking about. It was the gathered people of God, the called out ones. Okay, so there you have kind of just an introduction to the subject of covenant theology. We believe in and affirm the unity of the covenant of grace and the oneness of the people of God in all ages of time. Scripture does not allow for any other view than this. Okay, and even you know the, the old school dispensationalists who think that um, Israel, pe the, that the Jewish people have some separate plan of salvation, that's dangerous because they most certainly do not. No, no Jewish person or Gentile person, no human being is ever going to go to heaven except 
by repenting and believing the gospel. So I do believe that God is going to call a future generation of Jewish people en masse to Christ. Uh, and when that happens, it's going to, it's going to signal the end because it's going to be the, the life to the world. Uh, the gospel is going to, to conquer the nations and people are going to be saved. Just multitudes of people are going to be saved. I think Romans 11 teaches that very clearly. Okay, if the, if the putting away of Israel um, meant life for the Gentiles, what will their fullness mean, uh, it says in Romans 11? Um, it's going to be life from the dead. It's going to be glorious. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, here are five basic points that I'm going to go through in this series, and these are very, very important. So I'm just going to list them here, and then we'll go through them one at a time. Once the covenant of grace had come to expression in the spiritual promises of the Abrahamic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant became salvifically definitive for all ages to come. Okay, that's the first point. B, that, that, that's why Paul explicates the doctrine of justification, not in terms of the new covenant, but in terms of the Abrahamic covenant. I always found that strange, even um, early on uh, as my, in my journey towards Reformation thinking. I always thought, no, 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 the new, the new covenant is, is the covenant. I mean, this is, that's where everything comes together. Paul doesn't reference the new covenant in his explication of justification. He only references the new covenant in two places. In 2 Corinthians 3, when he says, we are able, as sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. And then in his um, narration of the institution in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11, um, it, where he quotes Jesus about the new covenant. Other than that, the new covenant doesn't even come up. He explicates the whole doctrine of the gospel in terms of the Abrahamic promise. Okay, second point. The exodus from Egypt, the Old Testament type par excellence of biblical redemption, by divine arrangement, exhibited the same great salvific principles which governed Christ's work of atonement, both in its accomplished and applied aspects in the New Testament, thereby teaching the elect in Israel about salvation by grace through faith in the atoning work of Messiah's mediation. Now, I've been preaching through the book of Exodus, and I'm, I'm finally going to get back to it this week. And it's glorious stuff to see. The gospel is just everywhere in the book of Exodus. It's, it's incredible when you look closely at it, how much, how much it's about Christ and how much gospel is there. Okay, third point. Moses and the prophets prophesied about the events of the New Testament age, including the death and resurrection of Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is the present day expression of the one people of God whose roots go back to Abraham. That's the fourth point. The church of Christ is the present day expression of the one people of God whose roots go back to Abraham. Okay, it's not Israel and the church. It's not, well, you used to have Israel, and now you have this new thing called the church. It's there's one church. There's one church. And in fact, what we're going to see this much more later. I, I'm, I'm going to resist the temptation to start getting into all the passages just yet. But just want to give a high-level summary here first. Okay, letter E. Number five. Fifth and final point. The requisite condition for salvation is identical in both the Old and New Testaments. The elect were saved, are saved, and will be saved only by grace through faith in the anticipated or accomplished work of the Messiah. Okay, critical key point. The requisite condition of salvation is identical. It's really identical from the moment man falls into sin until the very last day of history. Okay, we are saved only by grace and through faith in Jesus Christ, either anticipated uh, or accomplished. In the Old Testament, before he came, they anticipated his coming. In the New, Co New Covenant era, now after the coming of Jesus Christ, we look back to his work in history. Okay, so uh, I'm going to try to make these videos a little bit shorter than usual. But there, there you have kind of a high level. I'm going to put a little bookmark here in my manuscript. And we'll, we'll try to get back to this later. I'll try to make these um, between 20 and 30 minutes each. But there you have kind of an introduction to just the, the beating heart of covenant theology and why we believe what we do about it. And uh, I'm excited to go through this and to look at all the passages. And I uh, appreciate the emails. I've gotten some really encouraging emails lately from people that have been listening to old videos and old sermons and stuff. And, I, you know, I've, I really work hard on, on all, all those things. So it's very encouraging to me that, you know, more people are benefiting uh, from, from that work. So thank you for listening. Uh, thank you all for listening or for watching.